You know, regardless of what one might think of Tom Cruise, there is no denying the man knows how to entertain people. His work ethic and drive to improve is obvious, with upgrades like Top Gun Maverick seeing him actually flying the fighter jets that so many others wouldn't dare, which is nothing short of incredible. And once again, he returns to the screen with another Mission Impossible. Now, this is an odd thing to mention, but I've never actually watched more than a few clips of this series. Yep. I am going into this review from as reserved and cold a position as I can, so the argument of you only like this because of nostalgia can go right up the ass of whoever says it. Before we rappel into this review, please subscribe to join my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 focuses on an experimental submarine partially operated by an experimental artificial intelligence that becomes sentient and sinks the sub by breaking the Logitech controller. This AI, called the Entity, was contained in a vault, not unlike Mother from Alien, and the only way to access the vault is a pair of keys. This leads numerous world powers into a race to find said keys, thus granting whoever obtains them access to and power over Skynet, allowing for total world domination. However, the boss keys are not so easy to come by, as the people who carried them floated out of the sub. Enter Ethan Hunt, assigned by the US government to retrieve the keys, but since he's played System Shock 2, he understands the Shodan-like AI cannot be allowed to exist, and he means to kill it. So he goes rogue, and in an attempt to retrieve one of the dungeon keys, Ethan crosses paths with Captain Carter, who is freshly duct-taped together as Grace, a thief in Way Over Her Head. After losing him, Grace is tracked down to Venice, where Ethan and all other parties, including a mysterious pair, one of whom, who is an enemy from Ethan's past, catch up with them. And as the chaos unfolds from one action set piece to the next, Ethan must remain focused, while Grace needs to make a choice, as numerous governments, interested parties, and even Gladys have a dog in this race. Something I'm sure a lot of people will make comparisons with are the recent legacy or franchise films that have come out like Indiana Jones and The Flash. Tom Cruise has proven himself to be a man who understands his audience, and he's willing to put himself on the line in order to entertain people, as he's known for being the American Jackie Chan at this point. Now, this could be because his ego is bigger than Arnold Schwarzenegger's in Batman and Robin, but at 61 years old, the man is flying F-18 Super Hornets and still runs like someone touched the thermostat. So if the choice comes down to another CGI slugfest with no sense of gravity, logistics, or power scaling, versus watching perhaps the last true action star of his time jumping a motorcycle off a cliff into what should almost be certain death just so I could have a smile on my face? Well, I'll be jumping on a couch with excitement at that prospect. The action is something this film delivers on big time. For comparison, take the chase scene from Indiana Jones and the Dial of Arthritis. Ford and others are clearly on green screen, and his stunts often use doubles that can still control their bowels, while Cruz is driving, dodging, and smashing cars like he and Keanu Reeves were buddy-buddy on a week's vacation at a demolition derby. The ratio of CGI to practical is almost completely reversed here, and it shows. And how refreshing it is to see female characters that don't overshadow, but rather complement their male counterparts. Captain Cut in Half here receiving most of the credit as a fish out of water and sort of audience stand-in, which works for me since I'm new to the series. She has a particular set of skills, but never once body slams a guy twice her size like she's Sonya from Mortal Kombat. She's believable given the circumstances as an expert thief and not really anything else, so during moments of vulnerability you feel for her, because being thrust into this world of espionage is like being a priest in a brothel. And of course, everyone else fills their roles just fine. Granted, most of them are sitting on their asses and talk to the camera with the intensity of a Spanish soap opera, so I'll take what I can get. Though that wouldn't entirely be fair to Isai Morales, who does a good job as the zealous and ruthless Gabriel, being a counter to Ethan in almost every way. He's straightforward and doesn't mess around, as many villains should be. Now, obviously I can't say much about Ethan, since I'm green to the franchise, but his morals and priorities won me over. So if he's consistent throughout the series, then great. Either which way, I do intend to watch the series now over time because of his values and the complimentary action. Now, there are a fair number of issues. For example, there are a fair number of conveniences for the sake of the plot progressing. Like I mentioned in the summary, all the bodies that were inside the submarine escaped it and floated to the surface? 
somehow. Not to mention the occasional saving of people that by all accounts should be dead, but they end up surviving somehow. This is often because people appear at just the right moment, like Batman behind a criminal who littered. Also, I don't know why, but there are some flat attempts at Marvel-style humor inserted into the action that feels as out of place as Aquafina in the recording studio. Remember my song in the swamp when I was like, wah, chicka, wah, wah, chicka, wah. Most work for sure, while others keep going. Think the unrestrained James Gunn humor, where the joke runs on longer than your wife's shopping list. Not to mention, it is inserted at the most awkward of times, like the obligatory car chase screeching to a halt just so the getaway car can do donuts, despite the American agents, Italian police, and third party all just sitting there slack-jawed. And this moment in particular is a good minute or longer uninterrupted. It made me want to rip my hair out like watching Dragon Ball Z characters stand there and not attack their opponents who are powering up while their guard is down. The writing could have used some polishing too, because after watching this, I am convinced the writers are huge anime fans. I wasn't expecting a script as captivating as Sound of Freedom, but I wasn't looking to have a thesis on repetition either. Almost every big speech is some variation of one that came before it. This weapon is too powerful for anyone to have, or you must choose, or you must stay the course and destroy it. And when a dialogue comes up that contains all three of those examples, you'll be looking for pliers so you can pull out your own teeth. It's the anime trope of repeating a line or a particular catchphrase so often it almost drives you insane, so you want to follow up Little Boy and Fat Man with Midwife. Lastly, and I'll preface this again, I don't know the series prior to this one, and this is more of a personal taste, but why are so many close-ups shot on a tripod with Michael Bay's head under it? Was the cameraman raped with a protractor? I would never conclude that a simple conversation could be improved by a 45-degree angle. So, there you have it, from someone who doesn't know anything about the MI series. It's a mostly solid action film, with good performances, a clunky story, and focus on practical execution as Tom Cruise is known for. It ain't anywhere near perfect by any stretch, but it will hit the spot for anyone looking for a competent action film after the recent few duds floundered like Ariel in a sushi mart. And this is only part one, so like Across the Spider-Verse, hopefully some character choices and parts of the plot are better explained and conclude reasonably, otherwise this film is going to age about as well as Mickey Rourke. Now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.